Interviewing more emotional, talking about the competitive scene of lore as well as the casual and the future of the game in general on this week's episode of the Twin Suns Podcast. Welcome back to the Twin Suns Podcast, episode 80, brought to you as always by RenteraCCG.com, where you can get all sorts of strategic advice and articles, breakdowns, tier lists, uh, including some done by this guy, uh, what's his name, Cruz? Mr. Uh, emotional, right? Emo? Emo, yeah, I think. Emotional, right? yes. Uh, yeah. Anyone you yeah, want something. can write on that site. Just kidding. Really, just the top tier players <laughs> like Mr. Emotional. So, uh, without further ado, I don't know. They let you write on there. That's so. true. <laughs> Pretty much anyone can write on there. Uh, that's Cruzen's voice, and uh, the other voice you're, you're going to hear in a second is the, uh, what was it? The Rising Rise of the, of under the Underworlds. Yeah, Rise definitely. of the Underworld Seasonal Champion, the DN Master himself, Mr. Mo. <laughs> Mo, welcome to the show, Yeah, buddy. what's up? Hey, thanks for having me, man. I enjoy, enjoy podcasts. I'm really surprised I haven't been on this one. I've watched it multiple times, so glad to be here. Yeah, we, we were waiting for you to, to win a seasonal before you kind of earned the spot, you know what I mean? So. <laughs> yeah, and apparently that's what happened. It's like, I win a seasonal and everyone's like, oh, I need to talk to that guy now. <laughs> I'm the same guy, I just did something. I just did something, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we, as soon as you won it, I think like four people in our Discord were like, yo, have Mo on. And I'm like, I think he's going to be pretty busy for this week, <laughs> at least, <Yeah>. guys. Like, <laughs> let them, I, yeah, no, I would have I done it. I just, I, it was a lot of fun. I enjoy podcasts. I was on, been, I've done a couple of podcasts and stuff like that before i won seasonals because my name was already kind of out there but yeah um, and i i enjoy podcasts i like talking with people i would never do my own podcast because i don't think i have the discipline to keep it consistent or to do all the behind the scene works like what i see and what viewers see is like oh yeah i just show up every thursday and my you know three two favorite people have a special guest on there and you know as a guest all i see is yeah i show up for this hour and leave <laughs> what I don't see is all the time put in beforehand, writing the yeah. props, editing. the editing, yeah, yeah, the editing, the all that, making sure it goes out onto all the different platforms. So I love being on podcast, uh, even though I don't think I could personally do one. I would love to be on a podcast like every week or every day or something like that. We, we yeah. got to book him, book him cruising. Well, cruising doesn't it's do anything fun. either. So it's it, <laughs> that's true. I'm, yeah. Uh, I'm just here for the ride. It, it's funny too because the the consistency is like one of the hardest parts, and we just came back from like a month long break. So we yep. definitely, I understand that for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, no especially doubt. as the game you know, some the ups and downs, but we'll talk about that there in a little bit. Right. For sure. Shane, so, you want to start by uh, just like introducing the people to Mo and yeah, yeah, we'll us, go uh, through uh, through some general background questions, and then we'll we'll dig into some more as we get through uh, a little bit deeper in there. So I guess so the first thing we normally ask guests is just really what you know we, we're talking about Runeterra in general, uh, a specific, very specific game. But what's your gaming history, even outside of card games in general? Yeah, so I actually don't remember doing anything with my free time before I was about. 14 or so other than play league of legends like so, if you ask me what i used to do on my free time I, I legitimately don't remember what games or anything i used to do before playing like season three league and ever since then that was like the only game i played and then by one of my friends i met through league that went to school with me um played magic and mm -hmm. i was like oh, okay i'll like try out this nerdy little card game why not i loved <laughs> it and then, so and then card games were kind of like my main passion starting at 2000 like 2016 or so 2015 hmm. 2016 and i've been playing magic up until they released lor and i was like well fuck i love league of legends and i love magic so might as well try out this league of legends card game and i've been hooked on it ever since the most surprising thing in that story is that you made a friend in league of legends yeah <laughs> that may be the yeah. first time i've heard that that's awesome yeah i actually have no idea i don't even remember how it happened because obviously the odds of making a random friend that happens to go to yeah. your school is really low but yeah, i seriously. legitimately don't remember like talking to any of these people beforehand mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah. i don't actually know how we ended up being friends or anything do you still play magic at all or is it you just all lor now no i don't i don't play magic uh the last set i played in magic was I think they released like a new Dominaria or something or a new Ravnica. It was whenever four mana Karn came out. Um, so it was, it was a couple of years ago, like three or four years ago, yeah. hmm. uh, 2018 or so. But ever since then, I've just been focusing on growing my YouTube channel and it's easier to stick to like 
one uh, sure. like game or content at a time. So and I've been enjoying TFT and League. So I uh, it's mainly, or sorry, TFT and LOR. So I've mainly just been doing LOR content. Yeah, yeah. makes sense. Yeah, it's a good time to do all that stuff with how much, you know, the game is just growing in general, but also just Riot yeah, yeah. is kind of going balls to the wall in every category. Yeah, dude, why, Riot's wild, and I don't know. I don't know what they're on, but they're, they're, they're on something crazy. Well, yeah, they really are. Speaking of Magic, they're doing a crossover with, with Magic, aren't yeah, they? Yeah, that's just they're like, yeah, that's wild. crazy. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know Riot, what to expect. Riot's going crazy right now. <laughs> they're dropping a game in every genre. They're out here dropping animated series they're driving wouldn't be surprised if they drop some type of book or some new book or something like that oh, a yeah. movie i don't know i don't even know what to expect at this point yeah That's yeah really it, but they're killing it too because like mm -hmm. arcane is legitimately one of the best things i've seen on tv in a while and yep. yeah i hear i haven't played it yet but rune king i hear really good things too so like yeah they're, they're knocking it out of the park right now no. yeah for sure all right so you said so, your card game history sorry real, real quick yeah. uh no, Magic, go ahead. did you have uh any other card games before? Or was it just straight magic into Runeterra? That's it? No, yeah, it was straight magic. I played like okay. a tiny bit. I played like Pokemon when I was a child, not knowing how to play. I'd fucking pick yeah. up a Pokemon card, throw, throw it down, and say, <laughs> my Pokemon hit your Pokemon. Yeah, yeah. And then I played Hearthstone when it very first came out, but that's because ah. I was playing magic already. And I saw this like Hearthstone beta game or whatever. I tried it out and I was like, I just would rather dedicate my time to getting good at magic. And just did that yeah. Instead. Yeah. Fair. That's very fair. I, I did the Hearthstone thing for a while, so you, you made the right decision. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm sure being as a like competitive player, I don't know how I would have felt about all the RNG aspects yeah. to it. I'm sure maybe if I, that's where I started, I would have maybe enjoyed it more or had more tolerance for it or something. But I think going from magic into a game with like, no RNG as far as cards are involved to a game like Hearthstone, whereas all the cards, or a good majority of the cards have some level of RNG to it. It could oh, be yeah. interesting for sure. Yeah, I, I started it playing competitive Hearthstone and I burned myself out on it just because in order to, I mean, yeah, this is sort of true in lore too, but you have to grind like all hell to yeah. actually qualify for something. And every time I did it, I didn't want to play the game for months after. Yeah. So. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's definitely, it's definitely something you could burn yourself out on, especially when you have to deal with all the tilt from RNG and stuff. So it just kind of piles oh, yeah. on. Did you, uh, did you make any content in anything before you got into lore, or is this your first foray into, into content creation uh, I, in general? So, like, way, way back when I got my first, um, like, decent computer, um, it actually sucked and could only stream this game called Town of Salem because this game Same. had, like, two frames per second and it's basically all this is just like a mafia game it's just okay. like mafia online and because it was a mafia game it was a lot of just like you typing like back and forth it ran on like one frame per second so i could stream it nice. um, and i put out a youtube channel on that like a long long time ago i had a like different name um and this was back when i was like 16 years old or so um yeah. but no one will ever find that first of all <laughs> um but other than that no this is my first like Right. attempt at actually doing content creation the the like correct way and stuff like that there's I a game for the indie though. show there shape yeah <laughs> <laughs> someone in chat said to eldest says town of salem's lit so someone else has heard of it there you go there yeah you go. yeah it's, it's pretty cool it's really small it's just like an older like yeah. browser mafia style game it was cool nice. it does sound fun. Um, yeah and i started this youtube uh i guess expedition i guess the october 2020 or so maybe 2019 Let's see 2020 yeah 2019 is whenever they like shadow dropped lor during the 20 yeah. the 10 year anniversary so yeah it was uh 2020 i believe nice or whatever it was i created a youtube channel made like two tft videos said like yo fuck this i'm just gonna play lor and just like made a bunch <laughs> of lor content yeah <laughs> nice so i mean we've been you know saying it obviously you're a youtuber uh as well as a streamer your thumbnails are incredible. Uh, absolutely love whoever does your yeah, thumbnails. Sarah. Sarah's nuts. Sarah's huge, cracked. Huge kudos. Thumbnails are insane. Um, so, yeah. I mean, do you have a preference for either Twitch or YouTube? You really like the combination of both? or? Yeah. So, I have a preference for Twitch um, because talking to a camera when there's no one actually there to respond to you can feel weird. And I'm just not used to it. Yeah. And at least Twitch, I can, like, talk with my friends or these people that I've met online that are actually there, even though I can't see them. Like sometimes we'll be sitting here and I won't realize that 
it's like hundreds of people staring at me through like a glass box. Right. But because I see them like typing in chat, I'm like, oh yeah, I could talk to you. And you're like actually here with me in a way. It's kind of weird. I don't know. So I like that a lot more. But as far as like success wise, I think starting on YouTube is a lot better. So I still put out YouTube content and try and put it out consistently because that's the best way to grow. But yeah. if I could have it my way, if they were like, you could be instantly successful on either platform, which one I'd say Twitch. Just because nice. I enjoy the community more. Nice. So do you, you, you're talking about podcasting that you didn't want to, you're struggling keeping up like uh, consistency and stuff. Do you find it difficult to keep up consistency on YouTube? Because that's a lot of work too, like cutting and everything. Um, sometimes. If you look right now, I don't think I've posted a video in literally eight days. Um, hmm. But I think that's because the holiday season is kind of wild. But yeah. before that, yeah, yeah. I put up a video like every day for two weeks or so. So it goes yeah. in spurts of like, um, depending on how the game is doing as well. Like if there's a new drop or something like that of uh, cards, like a new expansion comes out, then yeah, I'll have content, daily content for like a month or two months. Yeah. Um, but it, once we get to where we are now, where the meta has been basically stabilized for two months and no new cards, no balance updates, um, it's basically the exact same game, then it's kind of hard to make competitive content, um, which is what my YouTube channel is about because I can make a bunch of arcane content. There's definitely a bunch of content to be made in LOR, yeah. But um, as far as my audience goes, they mainly want to see things like deck guides and um, like meta tournament Mondays reviews and, and yeah, meta Mondays yeah. and stuff like that. And there's only so many decks in this meta in two months. So I eventually right. run out of deck guides. Like the most played deck right now is GP Sejuani. Well, I did a GP Sejuani deck guide, you know, like a while ago. Right. Um, right. You know, Draven's Eye on, I did that deck guide two months ago when the deck like first popped up so yeah. unless i would start reusing content in that sense it's hard to make competitive content um and so i do put out the like more i don't want to like say make this sound like disrespectful but the more like for fun content um like the yeah. lab runs the path of champion runs and crazy stuff like that like meme decks and they do like okay but definitely not nearly as good as what other people have because my niche isn't for fun content yeah if someone wants to watch for fun labs they're gonna have a lot more fun watching somebody like swim or like mogwai or right, one right. of these like saucy mailman um silver fuse like these people whose branding is fun like we are fun people that do fun crazy shit like that's what we do of course yeah. their content's gonna be a lot better and it's gonna be a lot easier to find whereas if you look for deck guides i think on every deck that i've put out a deck guide for if you look up a deck guide for that deck mine comes up first mm -hmm. so i have like this niche market that I'm in and I'm good at it. But anytime I have to do something that's not that specific market, uh, it doesn't do, my content doesn't do very well. Makes sense, yeah. yeah. So you I can mean, do deck reviews for non-aggro decks. Imagine that. <laughs> yeah, I do <laughs> deck reviews for non-aggro decks, yes. I do deck reviews for all kinds of decks. <laughs> all right, so we got to bring up the aggro thing. So yeah, Mo, I uh -huh. mean, it, it's a little bit self-inflicted, right? I, I was looking yeah. at, uh, to get the... Uh, the the name of the seasonal that you want it does say best aggro player in play room terror in the bio so it is yeah. it is the niche uh of uh -huh. the thing but um that's been in your twitter bio twitter bio for like a year or more <laughs> hasn't it yeah that's been in my twitter since bio i remember since, uh, uh i'd say the second seasonal the seasonal right yeah. after the winter of go hard happened so like, oh, literally, yeah. i think the second seasonal it was a dark was, winter <laughs> yeah the, yeah the, the go hard winter is yeah. what we call it. we uh ever since that i've kind of been nuts um basically i was playing like discard aggro and indoor and uh because mm. I, I wasn't really having too much success in lor up to that point and then I, someone was like, oh, yeah, this indoor deck is, like, nuts. And I was like, oh, I could play, like, an aggro deck? And they're like, yeah. I was like, okay, sure. So I looked, discard <laughs> aggro, indoor, and I don't even remember what my third deck was. But those two decks were never banned, and I won the very first tournament ever playing indoor. And I was like, nice. oh, these aggro decks are pretty cool. Yes. And <laughs> aggro is a lot of what I played in Magic as well. Um, in gotcha. standard, I played a lot of RDW. Um, and in modern, I played a lot of humans and, like, Death Shadow and stuff like that i played a little bit of like affinity but mostly humans and so i had played a lot of aggro there just transferred the skills over here actually picked up aggro decks and i was like oh well what yeah. do you know who knew i i wanted to ask about that so i i feel like you know memes aside there is this kind of both across the casual but somewhat into the competitive scene too where there's like people think you know aggro in general is the like no brain play cards mm -hmm. deck uh, and, you know, it kind of gets memed on a lot 
But yeah. I have always been of the opinion that aggro decks require just as much, and if not in some scenarios, more skill to pilot correctly. It may mm-hmm. be different in other uh, other card games, but like, what are what are your thoughts on like what how, how aggro compares like in LOR to other card games? I guess yeah, Magic so, would be a main reference. Yeah, so people that say um, aggro is like the brain dead easiest um, type of archetype to play in LOR, uh, and my opinion, they don't understand the fundamentals of LOR. Because fundamentally, um, being the proactive player is horrible in LOR. Mm-hmm. Uh, I always compare it to CSGO or Valorant, uh, for any of you that play those games. Uh, those games are very CT-sided, which means they're very defender-favored. Yeah. So the players that have to be proactive in that game and actually attack the sites are at huge disadvantages. And LOR, it's actually the same concept. If you uh, want to use an example, imagine you're like in a 1v1 with Demacia and somebody single combats your unit, that person's at an immediate disadvantage because the person reacting to the single combat knows exactly what um, card they have to play around in single combat. They know exactly how much mana you're going to have afterwards, so they know what to play around. So let's say you single combat and go down to three mana. They know they don't have to play around barriers. They don't have to play around concerted. They can o- they only have to play around a single pump spell. Like that, You have so much more yeah. information being the reactive player that being proactive just sucks. So because of that, playing aggro and LOR is just um, uh, fundamentally harder because you have to be the proactive deck. You can't be the FTR deck that says, I'm going to pass for seven turns, play an FTR, and hit you with two overworld units. Yep. Um, you can't do that. You have to be the proactive. So you have to play into the avalanches, and you have to gauge, like, how much can I be proactive without getting punished? Or how much yeah. can I be proactive... Um, or like how much can I pass because I want to play on avalanche, but you don't want to pass too much because now you're just missing out on value and missing out yeah. on damage. Cause if you pass for too many turns and it's turn five and you're just attacking with like two twos, then that's not going to be good either because you're never going to win the game. So yeah. that's a huge misconception and LOR specifically um, that I think is really funny. And whenever I hear people say that, I just assume that they don't really grasp the major yeah. fundamentals of LOR. And yeah. other card games I've had experience in, mainly being Magic, yeah, in those games, aggro definitely is more um, what people call like easier or brain dead because um, you don't get punished for, or sorry, you get really punished for missing your turn ones. Um, so you could go like turn one, attack you, turn two, attack you, turn three, attack you. And if your opponent is on a control deck or something and they don't have a one drop and a two drop and a three drop, they straight up just like miss out on those turns. Right. Whereas mm-hmm. in LOR, if you don't have a one drop and you don't have a two drop, you're not you punished because mana. you have yeah you have six yeah. mana on turn three yeah, yeah. so you can still do avalanche vile feast or you can still do like a bunch of spells or even make a unit sometimes with your six mana and like you yeah. don't actually get punished for missing these crucial early game turns yeah yeah i love yeah. that I, I haven't thought of it that way before at all and it's definitely like very correct i feel like i always thought about it or always heard about it as in that you have to make less decisions, but each one's a bit more important when you're playing aggro. And sure. I, I get that vibe as well, but I really do like the the fact that, yeah, it, it is a defensive-based game for sure. You don't want to be the active yeah. player. Yeah, I mean, like, passing is one of the most powerful things in LOR with, like, the back-and-forth nature of it. So, like, mm-hmm. you can't really afford to do that as much when you're playing aggro. Plus, I, I feel like on top of that, you know, a control player can save tools to, to try and, you know, stay alive and get to their, their win condition. Whereas the aggro player kind of has to be planning three turns in advance because, like, yeah. you run out of resources a lot faster. So you need to know, like, okay, if I'm going to get lethal, I have to do it in this amount of time before I, you know, I, I, I you know, resource yeah. out of the game. So. The biggest thing for aggro players is if you can play, if an aggro player knows when they can start passing and be reactive, that's like the scariest thing. Um, if you get an aggro player that knows when to pass, when to be reactive, so they no longer have to be proactive into your stuff and force you to become the proactive player, now you're in, you're in hell. Like, you can't really get away from that. And that's something that I feel like I do fairly well. Like, going back to the seasonal I won, I played against a Lee Sin player, and it got to the point to where I was forcing them to be proactive, and I was saying, hey, no, like, I'm not going to play any more cards you because I'm winning. Even though I only had, I think I had, like, four damage in play or something. I was like, this four damage can carry me if you don't play cards. They didn't understand what I was doing. So they were like, oh, well, I'm the reactive person here because you're Mr. Aggro. You have to play cards. And two turns later, I won the game. Yeah. Um, so it's definitely 
the biggest key to playing aggro is learning how to optimize your leverage and optimize your damage. Like every single point of damage matters because you're always on a clock when you're playing aggro yeah. for when your opponent can just turn the corner and take off on you. And just like, okay, well sure. now I have my thralls out or now I have a leveled Lissandra or now I have my Scion or something like that. Yeah, for certain. Uh, the, really, the last thing I want to bring up here in the more opening discussion is uh, the fact that we, we did discuss Meta Monday, so you know, you've been posting consistently uh, when the Meta is needing a, an update uh, to the tier list. Yes. You'll post a video um, describing essentially the top hmm, what, 8 to 10 decks or so in the Meta. Yeah, 8 decks, yeah. Uh, and you're adding to that now uh, on Runeterra CCG as well, right, with a little additional breakdown of words and stuff. Can you just give us a rundown of what the, the plan is there going forward on that site? Yeah, so uh, I post articles every Monday for Runeterra CCG that do go hand in hand with my um, Meta Monday videos I post on YouTube. Uh, the difference is my articles is more of a personal uh, power ranking of the latter. So my Meta Mondays is pure stats. They're like cold stats telling you this is what people are playing. This is the win rates on these decks. And what I post in my articles is uh, on Runeterra CCG are more of my opinionated power ranking so even if gp sejuani is the most played deck with the highest win rate i could put something like poppy zed as being the most powerful ladder deck because it um beats things like gp sejuani or it beats three out of the four top played decks so even though it's not the most played deck it's not um the highest win rate deck if played correctly i believe it could be the most powerful deck uh, on ladder and it could do the best for you as far as gaining lp goes and that's what those articles uh, over under terra are or Runeterra CCG R4. Nice. Very cool. So yeah, if you guys haven't checked those out, highly suggest it. Uh, you know, I, I was just reading through this one. Uh, to be perfectly clear, if we haven't on the last episode, but Cruz and I haven't played competitive in a month. Uh, we've been chilling. <laughs> we came back. We've been playing a lot feels of... Weird. Uh, yeah, it does feel a little weird, but came back. We're both playing other games and Path of Champions uh, a, a ton. I just beat Nautilus with Jace yesterday. I was I was doing Jumping Jack. Dude, Nautilus took me like 10 tries. Dude, tough <laughs> on everything was bonkers. But yeah, so we've been playing a lot of that. So uh, again, if the meta is needing of it, uh, check out Moe's for sure. Don't come to us for competitive advice right now at all. Uh, although a lot of the decks do seem pretty similar really? to a couple months. <laughs> it's true. Probably just never come to us for anything uh I, tr all. I tend to be a competitive player, but I don't put in the time that, you know, real competitive players do. So it's like, yeah. it's hard to, uh, I, I always hesitate giving actual advice. I'll just yes. watch, uh, I'll just watch most of it. <laughs> yes. And then when I even try to play competitive, it's normally with three jank decks anyway. So I'm not the person <laughs> to get advice from. Uh, so we'll jump into like more of the main topic. So first one really is just kind of the overall feel of the game for now. Uh, there's a little bit of discourse about is the game, you know, slowly on a decline? Is it? dying you know everyone throws around the, the game is dead terms constantly um there's definitely uh a lot more production value going into the pve side of things right now i mean they made a whole team for path of champions they launched that mode uh they did drop new cards as well uh albeit it's it, only a few cards i think we got like 10 or 13 cards with jace and his package uh no balance patch for this time and in the future What's your initial take on it? Are you worried about the game in the competitive sense? In the sense overall, is the game on its way out? W what is your take on that, Mo? Yeah, so I definitely don't think the game is dying, but I'll guess that's like a longer answer, so I'll give that in a second. Um, I do notice that they're putting a lot of more resources and stuff into things like Path of Champions. And I think that's for a couple of reasons. One, we're in kind of this off season where the seasonal doesn't actually count towards worlds. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot less stakes in things like seasonal. So there's no actual incentive to hard grind because your biggest reward at the end of it is you get to play in a seasonals. Uh, there's no like, gra like mucho grande picture that you're trying to shoot for with the right. season. So right. because we're kind of in an off season and the same with reason of why there's no balance patch in the next couple of months, and we've had the same meta for a while that I look at path of champions as a way to kind of like detail and just relax and it's like, yeah, this is an off-season, so here you go. Here's this, like, really cool experience. It's really fun um, yeah. game mode to play during your off-season. And I think that's extremely smart by them. And I also just look at this as probably the biggest, like, nine-head PR move they could have done <laughs> with Arcane coming out. Yeah, um, oh, yeah, for sure. Because everybody coming over from Arcane, they're not going to want to come over and grind a ladder. They're not going to come over and drop money and play Draven Scion. They're going to want to <laughs> come over... And play right. Jinx and Vi and Caitlyn and all these champions that are in Arcane. Yeah. So yeah. if you put a game mode into your game that literally says 
this is arcane the game mode people are just going to come over and play it and then your oh, numbers yeah. are going to jump and skyrocket it makes it really easy to navigate um and it's really really cool so that's why i think we'll i've gotten three play. friends into lor this week because yeah. of this mode tying into arcane they're all yeah. like i don't know anything about league but the show is awesome and i was like check yeah. out this mode yeah so it's definitely it's definitely perfect for that yeah i saw a lot of riders were actually talking about how lor was the best game to play if you have absolutely no knowledge about yeah. Yeah, league sure. about the lore about anything like that but you want to get into the world because of arcade that a lot of um riot employees like high riot employees said legends of runeterra was the place to go because right. it has very low uh cost to entry you don't have to spend a bunch of time learning hundreds of champions and mechanics like you do in league um same thing goes for tft and because yeah. of this game mode you literally just pick up the game all the cards have their own lore behind them um you can type in the jinx deck they give you a free jinx deck and a free caitlin deck and a free vibe deck when you load up the client so yep. you already have like ways to play you don't even have to worry about what is a good TFT comp? Like, what do these champions do? How do I do this? You know, yep. you don't have to worry about any of that because they give you all the tools. All you have to do is just play the tutorial, learn the basics. And while you're playing this lab mode, it teaches you the basics, yep. which is really, really cool. And yeah. gives you more free cards. Yeah, and it gives you more free cards. So it just yeah. sets you up for success. And at the very worst, if you end up not liking the game or not wanting to put time in to learn the competitive mode, you still had a very enjoyable experience with this PvE uh, mode that was literally designed for like new players and for fun. Yeah. yeah. And it's not always fun for uh, a guest to come on the show, and then I just completely agree with everything they say. But yes, uh, <laughs> I agree with all of that. Uh <laughs> fully everything about that i agree with i think a lot of people and mountain dew love was talking about i wonder what the player count history has been like over this past year i think some of the people are uh, looking at you know the number of master players and saying okay we might right. not even hit 700 and things but realistically definitely yeah they're not gonna hit 700 yeah. definitely not yeah now right it, yeah. now it's like the last day so mm -hmm. yeah there is a, a worry there but like you said uh there is so much hype around Riot in general. There are plenty of other Riot games to be playing. They all have events going on in them. I mean, yeah. it, there's a lot going on right now. And like you said, I, I'm pretty sure the numbers are doing just fine with Path of Champions coming out. And uh, I was going to say, we, yeah. we talk about this on the show a fair amount too, but like, I, we tend to be competitive-minded players, so we come at it from that perspective. Mm -hmm. But it's easy to forget, especially given like most of it's an off-season, like... The master's ladder is not a very good indicator of the yeah, overall value. Like 99.5% of the people playing Legends yeah. of Runeterra don't give a crap about competitive, you know? Yeah, yeah. and uh, out of those 99.5 that don't care about competitive, those 0.5 that do care about competitive, not even all of those people are going to be masters. Like a lot right, of those people right. are going to still be, not saying, yeah, they're going to be stuck in diamond as in like diamond's a bad thing. Like diamond's still fucking amazing. Yeah, but yeah, they right. are going to be in places like high or like diamond or very high platinum sometimes because they just are adults with real jobs and yeah, don't have yeah, right. you know time to be spending five to 10 hours a week playing Legends of Runeterra. And that's what it takes. If you're good enough to get to platinum, you're good enough to get to masters. It yeah. just takes mm. time. And there are definitely some stuff you can work on. I'm not saying if you hit platinum, therefore you are equal to masters players. Um, there's still a bunch of things you can work on for sure. Just like there's things master players can work on. But for the majority of it, it's going to be just time commitment. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, you get better. You can get there faster, mm -hmm. you know, if you get better. But right. yeah, it is a you matter can... of... Mm -hmm. It's just, it's a, it's a grind, but that's kind of like, yeah. the, it's built that way on purpose, you know? Yep. Yeah, yeah, but it's a ladder because you are trying to grind and climb right. to the top of it. So it makes sense. Yep. As far as the game dying, my experience, so I, I do coaching. Um, I've done coaching for almost a year now. Um, hmm. And some months it as well. Some months it's not, you know, too crazy. I'll just have like one or two. Some months I'll have like 10. Yeah. Um, like co uh, people, and most of the people get between two to four hours. So that's usually somewhere between like, four to eight hours of coaching to like 400 to 800 hours of coaching. Like it, it's or two to 200 like hours of coaching in a month sometimes. And it gets absolutely crazy. Um, and the last two weeks alone, I've had eight different people hit me up for four hours of coaching. Nice. So like yeah. that's just in the that's last two time. weeks, not even including the last month. So the game is definitely not dying as far as, my experience of people wanting to get into the game and people wanting to get into specifically competitive because some of the people that have uh, hit me up for coaching 
are brand new to the game. They're like, right. yeah, I'm in like iron and I just want to know like how to play. Like I've played some card games in the past, but I just kind of want to, I want to play the game. I don't want to be bad. This looks interesting. I like League or I liked Arcane. Teach me. And then some people are like, yeah, you know what? I'm ready to, I'm ready to make that jump into competitive. Like I've been diamond every season now. I'm ready to hit masters. Like, like literally right before this podcast, I was talking with someone who's played since beta and they've peaked diamond every single season except for one. Hmm. And they're like, yeah, I'm just trying to figure out what I can do to get to the next step so I can start right. competing in tournaments and in seasonals. And, you know, I'm trying to help grow the competitive seed. And yeah. so, so you just said my... play more and ended the session, right? Yeah, I just said get good. <laughs> I said get good, play tier one decks. And then just fucking hung up on his ass. Well, that person is uh, in the chat. So <laughs> there you go. Oh, so hey. that was you. Yeah. So hopefully yeah, that's not that, what yeah, happened. Yeah, that was me. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, so the, the game is definitely growing. The community is growing. Um, nice. It's definitely not, not going down. I think people just look at things like the master's numbers and knee jerk reaction and the streamer numbers too. Yeah, um, for sure. I've seen some people comment on how. Uh, players have stopped streaming LOR either completely or have taken a, a multiple streamers have taken a break from streaming LOR and they yeah. think that's like this big indication of LOR is dying. The top streamers aren't even streaming the game anymore. Or they're streaming other games and it's like yes and no. That would be a concern if the game was at its like peak and they were trying to get a bunch of people in. But yeah. because we're at this point where it is an off season and Riot themselves have come out with plenty of other games. Like they just came out with a new TFT set. They just came out with Ruin King, Hextech Mayhem, arcade they came out with just like so many different games and new games and that's just from riot that's not including what the fuck halo just dropped this new call of duty <laughs> yeah. just dropped like yeah. all these games just dropped like in november november is video game month yeah like yep. every new game comes out in november so it's not surprising to see numbers dip for lor because people yeah. want to play other games like that's perfectly yeah. fine especially when you're in an off season so yeah. i don't think streaming numbers and masters uh ladder should be an indicator of how strong or weak the game is doing yeah you know i'm glad I think what should be an indication should be do the devs fucking care and the yeah fact that right. they just uploaded like a brand new team yeah. to give us this insane uh, i actually did the calculations for the hours of content for arcane or sorry for um path of champions yeah so it took me 11 hours to beat jinx um path of champions like 11 hours of content um yeah and that was me like trying i wasn't even trying to necessarily like have fun i was just trying to beat yeah, yeah. champions right so if you take that 11 hours on average and you multiply it by the 15 champions there's over 150 hours just yeah. in what we have right now and that's not including like the rerun uh content that's not including going back and trying to have fun or do challenges like just if you're trying to beat the the thing it could take a hundred and you're already hours. good at it so you go yeah, yeah you right know. yeah exactly so it's like yeah. there's so much content to be made they yeah. wouldn't be producing 150 plus hours of content to be made they wouldn't be producing a brand new team a brand new yeah. game mode they wouldn't be doing nearly as much to care about lor yeah. if they yeah. didn't plan on keeping it around for a while or at least trying their hardest to keep it around also yeah, they yeah. just put out an application or uh they were looking for people to hire for lor i think within the last month or so yeah. they yeah. put out a job application for their um like quality assurance team so they would not be continuing to hire people yep. if they didn't they plan on the game like expanding yeah they're hiring murderers to kill the game i think is what yeah that's what it is they're hiring <laughs> blizzard employees qa murderers. Yeah. yeah too soon because too the other thing is like looking at twitch numbers is such a terrible metric too because a I, I stream occasionally myself and streaming a card game first off is hard like yeah, it's card a very suck. targeted audience. You have a lot of dead air to fill. Which say, yes. card, games card games suck. suck. Yeah, card yeah. Games just yeah. like even like if, if you, you don't play the game actively, you have no idea what the hell's going on. Yeah, and know? even Hearthstone, the most uh, successful online CCG in, in the history of online CCGs. If you go to Hearthstone right now, I'd put money that one the viewership is not what you think it is. Yeah, maybe less than like easily less than ten thousand viewers total. And then on top of that, um, the top, like, out of the top five streamers, maybe one of them is actually playing Hearthstone. And the other four are playing Battlegrounds. Yeah, it's all Battlegrounds, which isn't yeah. even uh, Which isn't even a card game. I mean, yeah. it's a card game. It's a deck builder. But it's not the actual, yeah, yeah. like, yeah. Um, the Hearthstone game. CCG, right? Right. It's like looking so, at TFT like, numbers and, next to War and, and card game, TFT, exactly. Yeah. And card game Twitch numbers always dip and peak in values of, of releases and stuff. So, it, uh, yeah, anyway, releases, moral of the story. And, content releases and stuff right yeah. yeah moral of the story is don't use twitch numbers to gauge how a game is doing yeah uh, but 
right, so sure. getting back really quick to the competitive scene here. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, obviously we already talked about how it's not you know necessarily relevant for Worlds, uh, but there is a seasonal coming up uh, mm -hmm. at, at the time of this recording uh, very soon. Uh, so actually by the time this gets out, it may even already have happened or be happening. Um, but uh, so are you uh, participating, I assume? And, and do you have an idea of what you're going to you're going to run? You don't have to I can't give away tell you all my secrets. secrets. What if the people well, no, go it, back in just time? Just say yes or no. <laughs> no, no. Yeah, I'll be playing the seasonal. Um, I'm thinking so there's two lineups I'm debating. I'm debating of bringing either the good player lineup, which is just like the three <laughs> best decks and you just plan to play better than the people you're sitting across from. And that's the GP Sejuani, Draven Sion and Poppy Zed. That's just the standard three best decks in the game. You bring those, you play better than people on bad lineups, or you play better than the people on the same lineup than you because you're a, a good player. Um, so there's that lineup. But the other lineup that I'm really, really leaning towards is kind of crazy. It's um, Lulu Zed, so I don't use Poppy. Then Poppy Misfortune Scouts, and then Azir Aurelia. And the idea behind that lineup is just to make sure that no Lee Sin players have fun because I hate Lee Sin. <laughs> Amen. I, hate Lee Sin I can get I behind this plan. Yeah, so my goal is just to make sure that I kill every Lee Sin player in the like game. It. And even if I go 0-3 and, and there's 0% chance I can make day two, I'm going to keep playing just in case I run into somebody <laughs> playing Lee Sin in their lineup. <laughs> just so if they're already 0-3, I can make sure they go 0-4. If, if you work already, you just became Shane's favorite player. Yes, uh, 100%. <laughs> yeah, I'm, the amount of times I've just closed the app after getting you know dragon mm -hmm. kicked to death from 20 <laughs> is yeah. outstanding. They need stats on that. Like how many times has someone just swiped up and closed just the rage app? quit. <laughs> after the dra <laughs> Nexus just got dragon kicked, dude. Uh, oh my god. Um, yeah. And it's funny you say that. It's like I had a feeling you were leaning scouts because I saw you tweeted the other day about how scouts were terrible. And I almost <laughs> actually replied to that's exactly what someone who loves pl or plans on playing scouts would say. <laughs> yeah, it goes in waves. Like I'll say Scout sucks, don't ever play scouts, and you can tell I just lost a game where I didn't draw a champion. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. Two hours later, I'll tweet out, damn, scouts is broken, and you can tell it's a game where I draw Misfortune and Poppy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And that's, just how, that's how scouts work. Yeah. That's epic. Uh, so I guess, it really, I mean, is there any predictions you have going into the seasonal? I think we're like two days away now. I, either for yourself, for the meta, any surprises, or if you want to shout out any players that you think are on the up and coming right now. Yeah, I think there's going to be a lot of people targeting Draven Scion. This is my prediction. And I actually think this is so dumb and has never once happened before in LOR history <laughs> uh, or in the seasonal history. But I think there's going to be so many people targeting what is considered to be the best deck and main deck that there actually isn't going to be that much of that hmm. best deck. Because mm -hmm. especially since the seasonal is going to be smaller because there's not going to be 700 Masters players. Um, and it's so easy to target this best deck in Draven Scion and Sejuani that you're going to have too many people do this like five head strategy of beat the best deck and they're going to get beat by two head players that just want to <laughs> play whatever deck they think is fun and stuff. And I think that's going to be really funny to watch. I'm always a fan that I tell people um, just bring whatever decks you enjoy because there's a thousand players in this tournament. Maybe right. like 200 of them at most are going to be actual like good players and the other seven to 800 players are just going to bring whatever decks they think are fun. Yep, they're yep, just going to bring yep. whatever lineup they enjoy playing because it's their favorite champion or they're going to bring the best deck but probably just not pilot it super well. So whatever they bring is basically irrelevant. Um, so that's you're also going to be playing for nine hours so enjoy the decks you bring yeah, yeah. so exactly you're going to be playing a long time so you don't want to get fatigued by trying to learn what your deck does and yeah, learn what really. your opponent's deck does just bring decks that you already know how to play as far as players yeah. um, to look out for um, I don't know of any up and coming I think Manasia will probably do well this season Manasia has been uh, he's been an unknown name in the community but I don't think he's actually won anything yet um, but he's been doing really well on ladder the last two seasons and he has a lineup he's felt really confident on. Um, so I think Manasia will do really well. Other than that, I don't know. I don't really see any new names doing well. I think MTux just won a tournament. Um, so like, I think that's the first time he's won something as well. So there are a lot of players that are winning their first thing coming up here recently that could do well in seasonals, but it all just depends on how much experience they get. Uh, ladder and seasonals are two completely different things. That's why we see some people get rank one every season rank one most seasons, but then they go 0-2 in every single seasonal. Um, and then you see some players that uh, do dog shit on water on a ladder, but do really, really well yeah. on seasonal. Like, yeah. I do okay on ladders. 
yeah, like I do okay on ladder, but all of the seasons that I've done well in seasonals, I didn't do well on ladder at all. Right. Like right now, I'm I literally have like 20 LP. So I yeah. like I'm nowhere close. And then the last season, the season that I won, I also had like a hundred LP or like I barely qualified for seasonals because ladder is just a completely different beast. Like oh, it's yeah. I don't want to say not competitive, but it's definitely a lot um, less competitive than things like uh, seasonals. So that's why you'll see a lot of players do well on this like less competitive uh, format. But then as soon as they get to this um, new beast, they don't know how to approach it. And they yeah. just kind of flop around. I think Mtuck enjoyed your, your shout out in chat too. So <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I, quick, quick question on that. So uh, how do you, so comparing Lanner and... Uh, seasonals or tournaments in general there's i've seen a lot of discussion around the format that they use the kind of yep. uh, uh what is it i guess it, the hearthstone Best term was last hero standing or whatever where are you, you talking about conquest win. like the, the conquest yeah, the, that's it yeah yeah, yeah. pick and ban yeah but i heard a lot of people talking about how they want to see it go to a one deck format with like a sideboard type thing do you have any thoughts on that like what's your preferred you know standard tournament format yeah, so I've played in both. I've played in many standard. Um, I played in many sideboard tournaments. I played in obviously like multiple, multiple of these conquest formats. I, I honestly think both is fine. I think people that say LOR is not designed for sideboard is kind of like bullshit because yeah. there are definitely plenty of sideboardable cards. If you're instance, landmarks would like to have a word just, with you. <laughs> yeah, just like off my like off the top of my head, the decks I or cards I immediately think of are cards like uh, Stony Suppressor. Uh, Stony mm -hmm. Suppressor is easily a sideboardable card. Yeah. Um, uh, the three mana spell in Shadow Isles that yeah, exiles passage every... Passage Unearned. Yeah, that yeah, one. Passage Unearned. Like, that's very clearly a sideboardable card. Like, there's For multiple sure. cards that are sideboardable um, that you will either never play in the main deck or play, like, one in the main deck because you would right. like to have it in your back pocket. And those are the exact cards you want in a sideboard. Um, however, I think because Riot is pushing the Conquest format so much that it's basically whatever Riot wants the format to be, that's what it's going to be. And yeah. because this is what they've pushed so much for the existence of LOR, this is basically what people are defaulting to. At this point, it's what people are comfortable to. So even if Riot comes out and says like, yeah, sideboard tournaments could be like completely fine, people are just going to be like, no, no, we play Conquest here. Like we've, we've played Conquest since it came out. This is what yeah. we're going to be hard, right. hard stuck on playing. Yeah. Yeah, I love like Conquest personally. Like building a, a three deck lineup and have like going through the matchups and targeting and trying to craft something mm -hmm. like that is way is the most yeah. fun part of the tournament for me. Yeah, definitely. That yeah. makes things a lot more interesting. It also it goes both ways because it makes um, Conquest can be extremely polarizing sometimes. Like uh, if you look yeah. at the seasonal I won, every single match in top eight was determined in champ select. Yeah, like, it literally did yeah. not matter. After, um, I guess my match against the Lee Sin player was the only match that was supposed to be won for him. But even that match, you can say on paper, it was determined. I just kind of uh, beat him. Um, but yeah. other than that, every other match went the exact way it was supposed to go on paper. Right. It was like the Azir Aurelia decks beat the control decks. The aggro decks beat the Azir Aurelia decks. It was literally like the entire tournament was just projected after top eight. Um, yeah. So that's really annoying. And sideboard tournaments can definitely solve that problem yeah. in a way of saying if you have a polarizing matchup you can tech into it with sideboards um the yeah. downside is sometimes if you play decks like lee sin with six eye of the dragons like you're just going to have an extremely polarizing matchup against some aggro decks anyways it makes it to where like this matchup is going to be completely unwinnable no matter what you play yeah or something and it could solve that because if you're an aggro deck and you see you're against this lee sin deck where no aggro plan is going to win Maybe you sideboard into a mid-range plan. Uh, maybe you sideboard right. into a more like, I have actual answers to Eye of the Dragons because like Culling Strike is a horrible aggressive card. I think everyone agrees with that. You'll never see a Culling Strike in Pirate Aggro. But if you're playing a sideboard game plan, you can say something like, I'm going to put two Culling Strikes in my sideboard just so I can beat Eye of the Dragon Yeah. for no other purpose except for yeah. Eye of the Dragon. And that could make a lot more matchups less polarized and a lot more playable that people think yeah absolutely no doubt well we're gonna start closing up here the last thing i really want to mm -hmm. talk about is the uh i guess the future uh, where the game's going obviously you know after talking with you uh it makes a lot even more sense to me that okay this is an obvious lull period and they clearly planned this to be a lull period with the 
obvious uh, the tournament doesn't count for Worlds just yet. This mm-hmm. seasonal and also other games are releasing, so let's put out a PvE mode. But things are going to shift. We're going to get another expansion of Bandlewood. We're going to get a balance patch that uh, the, the uh, two devs uh, that were online, I know, uh, I'm so bad at names right now. Uh, Alex, who came on our show, and then the other one, I think, mm-hmm. Ryan Aleko, both were polling uh, people. So if, if you don't follow those guys on Twitter, definitely check them out because literally people were engaging with devs about balance updates that they would actually put into the game or not. So that was super sweet. But it doesn't have to be a specific balance update, but in general, I guess stick on the competitive side for now, and then we'll go to the casual side. What do you want to see more of uh, in the game going forward? Um, I definitely want to see more like crazy shit happen. <laughs> I'd rather Riot just go shit wild and buff like every card in the game than to see them change like and like over buff the bitch. I mean, like make yeah. it crazy because if you give us like eight crazy things there's a chance that they kind of balance each other out For and sure, in yeah. worst case scenario you give us um like an emergency patch or something like that and right. that's something that they said they're more open to now like that's in their balance cadence is they're more open to these emergency patches um so if you're already saying you're open to that like give us some crazy shit like give us i don't know like make a two mana two three elusive and like there's that three mana two three elusive in PNZ. I forgot its name, astronaut or something like that. Yeah. Like make him a two drop. Like give me a two mana two three elusive. Let's see how crazy PNZ um, elusives can get. Let's see how crazy ephemerals can get. We haven't seen Hecarim played since beta where he was he, he was super broken, right? So give me some crazy like buff all the stats on ephemeral or make like ephemeral say when I strike kill me instead of saying like when I die or at the end of turn kill me. Yeah, make yeah. it say something like when I strike kill me. So that way. You can play an ephemeral unit, and if they do a barrier or something to stop your attack, you're allowed to just click the pass button and not get so punished that yeah. you lose the game off of that play. Like, you can do something like, yeah, sure, I'll skip this attack, and then I'll just set up for a really big open attack, because that's the biggest weakness to ephemerals is right. you can't open attack with that deck because that's not how ephemeral works. So it yeah. gives you more counterplay. Um, it's, just, it's crazy shit like that. I would like to see more shakeup. None of this go two plus months bullshit with the same exact same meta minus zoe nami (laughs) we don't want to see we don't want to see none of that we want to see crazy like stuff that's actually impactful that makes the game feel fresh and not okay this game will feel good for two weeks and then on that third to fourth week we're going to be tired of seeing the same three decks over and over and over yeah for sure as far as um casual wise like make some of the not fun interactions go away. Like, listen, whether or not you believe it's competitive, or sorry, whether or not you believe it's balanced or not balanced, if you think it's super broken or if you think it's completely fine, it is not fun to play against. Yep. Getting 20 to zeroed is not fun. If yep. I introduced my friend to play and the first game we loaded up was Lee Sin, where he couldn't attack because I had the dragon every single turn, and then turn eight comes along and he just gets killed in one turn because of Lee Sin, and he tries to kill it, and he gets denied because removal sucks in this game. Um, <laughs> like that, he will never play that. I would never play this game again if I was in that spot. Same yeah. with Azir Aurelia was so toxic because if I loaded up and it was my turn five, and I'm like, oh cool, I get to do some cool shit here on turn five, and my opponent goes, oh, even though it's your turn and it's only turn five, attack you, and then yeah. attack you three and more then times, attack you for a third yeah. time yeah, on yeah. your turn on turn yeah. five. Like make these unfun interactions happen less often or not at all because i don't say not at all because obviously someone is going to be having fun the person doing it is going to be having fun yep but make it to where it's so hard to pull off to where it feels really rewarding fun fact leeson is not hard to pull off a zero brain cell player can go play eye of the dragon play spells every turn leeson zenith blade twin disciplines i have lethal like that is not difficult doing something at least with a zero relia there were some turns that you had to navigate somewhat a little bit difficult. Yeah. It's just like, make it so it's big reward for at least like big play, not just I played two spells and I won the game. Because that was the problem with Watcher. Like Watcher Ugh. was, I played Pillar, I played Pillar, I played Pillar. Okay, I win the oh game. My God, yep. Like what part of that took any amount of actual effort or skill? That's like, the only really. deck in recent history that made me just legit want to stop playing them too. Yeah. <laughs> like, I hated that deck with a these, fiery passion. Yeah, these non-interactive, non-fun yeah, stuff. Like get them get them out of the game and more 
uh, like Timmy's will actually enjoy the game because they don't have to have this worry. I remember talking with a YouTuber. I'm not going to name them because I don't want them to. I don't know if they would appreciate being named, but they were actually like disliking making content at the time because they're uh, more like for fun uh, uh, content creator. Yeah. So they make a lot of meme decks and they do that. They literally could not make meme decks because Azir Aurelia and TF Fizz were being so played yeah. in normals. Yep, exactly. That they would load up, see Azir Aurelia or TF Fizz, and quit and then go to the next game load up they see the same deck and concede and it was not worth it between that and obviously meme decks aren't going to work every time because if they worked every time it wouldn't be a meme deck right so between <laughs> the frustrations of your deck only going off 10 percent of the time and then mm -hmm. hitting a uh azir tf fizz the other like 80 percent of the time you basically get like one game an hour at most yep, and it's yeah. just not worth it at that point for your mental health to try to go through <laughs> yeah, that really. to put out like a 10 minute 20 minute youtube video on this for fun deck that's supposed to be fun you're supposed yeah. to be enjoying this and having fun with the game yeah and then your and viewers try to play it and they run into the same issue and they're yeah, not and having then, fun exactly yeah. and then instead what happened is you just spent three hours of beating your head against the wall to get two games that you don't even know are good but at this point you're just gonna throw them in there because you yeah. have them yep and you don't yeah. want to play anymore Yep. Yeah, it's it's ridiculous. I mean, definitely negative play experiences are something that they have shown a little bit of cadence toward. You know, like they'll nerf mm -hmm. some things that don't have the highest win rates or, you know, play rates because of a neg negative play experience. But I'm all for amping that up as well. I mean, there's plenty in the history that you can, people will point and say, well, Fiora has two health now, et cetera, et cetera. But like there there's still plenty out there. And yeah, it yeah. definitely would help players not instant concede or close the app. Right in my in my sense <laughs> um, yeah yeah i mean uh, i'm pretty excited about the game I mean, we, we are just coming back as a cast right now we're we're slowing down our cadence because we were out grinding too just doing everything behind the scenes we're getting a lot so we're back for every other week uh making content here and again we're, we're sticking for mostly casual stuff at the moment we love interviewing competitive players and mo's the perfect fit of uh, really good at both so honestly thanks mo for coming on appreciate it yeah no thanks for having me man i'd love to do more of these so anytime you Guys are desperate and need somebody last second. Make sure <laughs> yeah. you hit me up. So. Yeah, we'll do. We'll oh, do. Yeah. Can, this is fun. Can you uh, can you just let the people know where to find you? Other than you know, like you said, Twitch, YouTube, you can link those. But uh, for coaching, anything like that as well. Yeah. So for coaching, you just hit me up through my Discord. I have Discord uh, description both in all of my YouTube videos, in my Twitch description, and in my Twitter description. Other than that, it's twittercom slash emotional, twitch.com or twitch.tv slash emotional, and then uh, like I said, my uh, youtube.com slash emotional as well. So emotional on everything, and then uh, spelled E M O E like the name Mo, and then Chanel. So yeah. perfect. Yeah, and all those links will definitely be in the description below. So guys, appreciate it. That's episode eighty. Thanks for hanging out. Thank you for checking this episode of the Twin Sons Podcast out. If you're looking to support us in other ways, you can check us out on YouTube at the Twin Sons Podcast. You can also check us out on Discord. Join our Discord where we have tons of great discussions and keep you posted on all of the content we make. You can follow us on Twitter, which is just twitter.com slash the Twin Sons Pod. You can also follow our co-host, Cruzen and Josh, and even Mikey, all on Twitter as well. Uh, all of those links will be in the description of the video or the podcast that you just listened to or watched. As well as uh, Twitch streams. We have all four of us are also streaming on Twitch occasionally, so you can feel free to dive into those. If you want to support us on Patreon to go even a step further, feel free to head over to patreon.com slash the Twin Sons Podcast. We have a bunch of different tiers there where you can actually uh, get different upgrades and different support for the show and actually get some nice rewards as well. And finally, if you want to check us out on Teespring, we have a bunch of cool swag based on the logos that we've had made for the podcast over the life of the show itself. So thank you guys again for all of the support and, uh, Catch you next time.